You are listening to the Energy is Love podcast. Energy is love. The Energy is the love podcast. The Energy is Love podcast. Energy is love. The Energy is Love. Hello, Stephanie. The podcast. Hello, for Craig. The universe. <laughs> the we took a week love. off. Podcast. We did. We took a week off, folks, and now we're back. We are here. What did you think, babe? It was, I was realizing today, because uh, obviously we knew we were going to record today, mm-hmm. and I was thinking about it, and I realized that not only did we take a week off, which we knew already from our end, uh-huh. but it's damn near probably a year, if not longer, since, since we've had week? a break from the podcast for a week. Ooh. Right? That should make me celebrate. Like, good for us, right? It is good for us. It is. There's that little twinge of me that's like, oh, sorry about that. Feel a little guilty, but I'm a little glad. It wasn't a. It, there's nothing to feel guilty I'm about. Just saying what I'm feeling. We needed a break. We did. It coincided with the beginning of Mars retrograde. How are you? How's How's everybody doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so good. Oh heavens! It's It's been It's been a mess. It goes until November 13th. You heard it, November 13th. <sighs> Do you remember the episode that we did where we talked all about retrograde stuff? I think so. We did at some point, right? Yes, we did. And we were talking about Mercury being the biggest. Like, there's like all of, obviously, not obviously, but multiple planets stir things up with their retrograding with temper their, tantrums. With their retrograde e. Yeah, with their retrograde Um, But Mars, what was it say? It, it, it's been direct for the last two and a half years. So it's been a while since it's gone backwards. And I'm like, <laughs> what were we doing two and a half years ago? I have no idea, but I did not know Mars was so serious about its retrograde. And I'm telling you what, I will never forget that. Yeah. Mars is, Mars comes in and is like, hold my beer. Oh, wait. Damn it. I just had it. Did you? It was, oh, shit. Now I have to go all the way back. Um, It has been a while Mm -hmm. since Mars gone retrograde. Mm -hmm. And it was really funny because we didn't know. And then the week started and everything just started fucking falling apart. Didn't I say, I'm like, what's in retrograde? You did. You're like, what the hell what is happens? going on? So then we did a little research and turns out it's the big red planet. Episode 168, thanks retrograde. We talk about Mercury and some of the other planets as well. but We didn't know if Mars was in the background being like. <laughs> yeah, if you're not familiar with what it means, it doesn't really mean anything unless you believe in it. And even if you don't believe in it, it still means something. And um, I look at the last week or depending on when this comes out, the last two weeks have yeah. been a little intense. Has your life been a little off kilter? Things not working like the way Mars that retrograde. It, 2020 does feel like Mars retrograde. <laughs> I'm really glad that it waited until the, towards the end of 2020. Yeah. Can you imagine if it would have gone retrograde in April? I don't even know. I don't even know. Would have been a I nightmare. don't even know. Yeah. I don't even know. So we had a break. Which was wonderful and mm-hmm. much, much needed. During the time off, we were still working, not just yes. like in the realm of life, but we also got some sponsors for the podcast, mm-hmm. which is super exciting. Um, the sponsors for this episode are Built Bar, right down here in the corner. I'll put an arrow in it's the video. Arrow? Can we? Can beep, we do that? Beep. No, Can you I, do no that? we can't. <laughs> I don't have do the... I need to make a red arrow that I can be like, that you can point yes. towards, that would be fun. Can I do that? Yeah, you can should I do, do that? that. Should I do that? You should do I that. I might do it. That would be fun. I might do it. Uh, Built Bar is a local company here in Utah that we've partnered with to offer you, the listener, a deal. And uh, yeah, go to... I realized that if they are listening to the audio version of this, they just heard that promo for mm-hmm. Built Bar. So you don't want to do it again? Yeah, so sorry for the repetitiveness. It's this is for the people that are watching it, perhaps. Yes. Go to yeah. energieslovepodcast.com. There's a sponsors tab at the top. You can find out information about Built Bar and what you need to do. Awesome. I have some fun things right off the bat. Do you really? Yeah, I do. Good. Yeah, I do. Okay. Can it I, can I play today. with some cards? Play with while the you're cards, doing baby. Touch the cards. Play with the cards. Um, I have lotion on my hands. Oh, don't play with the cards then. It's Seriously. all rubbed in. It's fine. Seriously. <laughs> <He's not kidding. laughs> don't fucking touch the cards it's with lotion on your in. hands. kind of rubbed in. Here, do they feel rubbed yeah, in? Yeah, yeah. Can I you, touch? No, you've got lotion on <laughs> your hands. So earlier today I saw a I'm quote. I'm having a hard time not touching now. Okay. You need something <laughs> to touch. My foot's down here. Touch my foot. I want the cards. Nope. You can What's touch the quote? my foot. I'll wait till you put the cards down, then I'll touch the cards. No, no. I'm going back and finding the episode... 
episode 35 with Dr. Rick Doblin. So okay. Rick Doblin is the founder of MAPS. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can go back to episode 35 of this podcast and learn more about him. But the f- quote that I found, um, for those of you that aren't aware of what MAPS is, it's the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And over the past, like forever, since the 80s, MAPS has been working towards getting psychedelics approved through the FDA in order to treat mental illness. And they are in the final phases of having MDMA um, federally approved through the FDA you in order to help and assist people with PTSD and some of those other kind of issues. Uh, so this quote is so fascinating. Is from and exciting. It's very exciting. It is from uh, Dr. Rick Doblin. It is our hypothesis is there is an inner healing intelligence. This quote, sorry, I had to pause because in the middle of the quote, they listed all the information. It is from a recent um, presentation that he gave at a 2020 virtual conference called Psych Congress. So if you go to maps.com, I'm sure they've, actually, I think it's maps.org. For me. Or it's easy to find them. I'll figure it out. Anyways, the quote from Dr. Doblin, our hypothesis is there's an inner healing intelligence. We all know that's true for our bodies. If you get a scratch or you break bones, your body has a mechanism to heal itself. There's this wisdom of the body to try to sustain itself. We think similarly there is something like that for the psyche. So that stood it out is to maps. me. It is maps.org. Yeah. That stood out to me today. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Why? Because I thought about, like I've had some things with my body recently right Mm -hmm. i think we talked about my broken almost broken leg on the podcast and it healed itself yes right magically it healed itself i've got other minor injuries it's it's like he said in the quote we get broken bones or scrapes or things like that and our body will heal themselves and they our body knows what to do so does your wife i think i had had some saying that (laughs) i was doing my that's what i did too i just you did that i brought the waves with the who's. Do you think our mental health and our mental wellness and our psyche has the same thing? The ability to heal itself? Yeah. Um, I have thought that very, very intensely, very strongly. That absolutely have, have the ability to do that. Heal itself. Take care of it. Um, But I think what I actually meant was just shove it down and not worry about it. So... I think it does have the ability to heal, but I don't necessarily believe that it's something you can do by yourself. It doesn't necessarily need, like, I don't know. I feel like you need help. Like, I've been trying to do it by myself for a long time, and I did not accomplish that. I could use some help. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I think it is possible, but you need more than your own banter. Yeah, <clears throat> it sparked a lot of thought in my head. When I read it and I'm sitting there thinking, initially I was like, oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Makes perfect sense, right? If our body can heal from injury, from physical injury, it's going to be able to heal the mind and some of those injuries that take place in our psyche. And then the more I, and the more I thought about it, I'm like, then why are there a bunch of crazy people (laughs) (laughs) that seem to continually slide deeper and deeper into craziness? Yeah. So it made me ponder longer. And I don't know. I, I I think that I like to think that it can heal like your brain, your mind, your psyche can heal itself just like the body can. But I agree with you in the sense that it needs help. Yeah. I mean, our bodies need help, obviously, too. Our bodies too, need help, too. Times, you didn't, right? like, get up and immediately start running marathons with it. Yeah. You gave it its moment to rest, too. Yeah. And I think, because I'm sitting here thinking about, like, a scratch. My a scratch doesn't need help to heal. It's just going to heal itself naturally. Should we try? Right. No. Don't scratch me. I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, like, what's the equivalent of a scratch to your psyche? Um... Boy, asking the girl with severe PTSD, not acute, chronic, um, what's the equivalent to a scratch? I have no idea. What would it be? I 
I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's brainstorm. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Because mine is, things are like scratches. It's like what a scratch would be to somebody with a, like a blood clotting disorder. You know, just a little scratch could be a lot more significant. What's a scratch? Oh, Jesus Christ. What's a scratch? Your husband asking you what a scratch is and putting you on the spot on a camera. I feel like that's a scratch. Well, I'm trying to think of like I don't know. over the course of my life. Where's your scratches? Yeah, what would be a little scratch to my psyche, to my mental health that just kind of healed itself? And all that is standing I've out to nothing. me feel like more than scratches. Yeah, like that's the all I can that come I'm up standing with. out, they feel like more than scratches. And so I'm trying to think of an example that I could draw from. Maybe the scratches are the ones that go unnoticed because you are affected, but then you heal from it. And so it goes on. It doesn't leave a scar. So that's why we can't conjure any of them up because they are the ones that go unnoticed. You don't like conjuring? No, no, it's good. Is it good? Or is it too scary? It's not scary. (laughs) Um, Yeah, they could have. Yeah, I guess that's a good theory. That's just my reason for the fact that I can't come up with anything. I don't know if it's fact or not. I'm just throwing it out there. Well, like think about it this way too. Like for like my shoulder, how my shoulder way back in the day, like 20 plus, maybe not 20 plus years ago, but um, way back in the day I injured my shoulder snowboarding and there's a still a big bump on my shoulder that you can feel and physically see it's visible. And uh, that never healed. That's not a scratch. Right. But uh, there's a big calcification up there in that joint. What if that is like, like what are the calcifications? What are, what are the calcifications to our psyche? What does that look like? So maybe mental I had blocks, a, emotional blocks, emotional blocks. I don't know. All of this like, Sanskrits in the wrong direction. Sanskrit. That's what those little canals called. In your... Is that what it's called in your brain? I, well, that's the. Like neural pathways mm-hmm. that when you have the synapses go, when you train your brain that when this happens or it starts off with this happens, this was the result or this was the path you went down and this is the result and this is what it meant. And so when that happens again, your brain's like, I know how to do this. And then when other things happen that uh, simulate, not simulate, yeah, simulate, trigger that feeling, you identify this feeling with this original, whether it's that or not. And then your brain says, I know what to do. I know the pathway. I know the result. So that's a pretty deep scratch. Yeah. And then you have to try and program your brain. I think I went off on a tangent. So I think that's the calcification or the walls. And then somehow you have to figure out how to get over those and take another pathway and be like, oh, this doesn't mean I have to go here. To retrain your brain how to react. Yeah. So that's, that's what I thought of. I think like in the scope of what he's talking about in regards to the work that MAPS is doing, because with their MDMA um, assisted, what do they call it? MDA assisted Assisted, psychotherapy or something. Um, Essentially, the client is going to have anywhere from like three to five, I think, sessions with a therapist during which they're going to take a dose of MDMA and essentially have a session during that time period. I have a therapist that I was going to, that that was an option, but then the world shut down. Yeah. So I could have information right now. I'm not going to give out any information regarding that because I don't know. But um, Well, hold on a minute because I want to come back to that. I'm not going to give out any information. You don't have to get any, okay. any information. No, but, I'm not going to. Um, not until I know I can. In my mind, that... So MDMA is going to be one of the things that is assisting that person. And then the therapist is another thing that's going to assist that person. But then essentially from my understanding is that like that person has to go through that space and through that journey and through that experience, um, obviously with help, like I said, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, they have to do that. Like it's a journey and and an experience that they go through. And that is so massively different than all the other like forms of medication that they put people on mm-hmm. to deal with PTSD, right? All the other forms of medication that aren't treating the 
issue. They're just treating the symptoms. The symptoms and create massive other issues Mm -hmm. and side effects and things that could be catastrophic. I know. (laughs) So that makes sense to me that it would be that like that's the part that is healing um, yourself, like your body, your brain, your psyche is going to heal itself as well, along with the assistance of the help. Yeah. Right. That's the kind of help I'm talking Real therapists, I have never, I have not taken that journey, but I think, I think if that opportunity is still present for me and I'm willing to take that journey because that's a scary thing just to be knowing that you're going to, it's, it's kind of like one of those things that you go into where you know you're not going to mess around. You know, you're not going to be like, well, I'll steer my therapist this way today because I don't really want to deal with this. You know, it's going to be something that you have to be really ready to show up for. And that's scary. Yeah. But I think from what I can gather without actually experiencing it, I feel like that's the key. I feel like it's hugely beneficial. And I'm so excited that it's a possibility out there and that people are already from whatever extent may be allowed experiencing the benefits of it. So do you feel like personally, if and when you get back to that spot, if and when you go back to see her, Mm -hmm. go back to see the therapist, that is something that you're going to push for? Um, Yeah. You think you're ready? Uh, I think if I go back, yeah, if I can pull myself to that strength to go back, because once I'm there, I'm ready. I'm like, let's do this Mm -hmm. right now. But right now, I am not at a let's do this (laughs) moment. I'm like, "Mm, we'll see. I'm pretty sure we stopped the quarantine, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's my my excuse. Everything else is coming back online, but I'm like, it is not responsible to go to therapy right now. I think it's going to help you so incredibly much. I know. But I'm scared. I'm scared. Can't blame you. Yeah. Spend your whole life hiding from shit and... It's going to come out. Like, what? Do you know what MDMA does, though? It makes it um, where it does come out, and you are able to move through that in that healing journey way, and it's not severe. You don't experience it like... um, Like a flashback. Yeah, you don't experience like a flashback, and like you can't taste it and smell it and all of the ways that... That's why you have PTSD and how it comes back. It's not like, oh, yeah, this thing happened where you re-experience it with all the trauma. Just talking about it. I don't even have a specific memory. Just the fact of knowing to going through it. I'm like, <laughs> trauma itself. Yeah. It's, it's like hurting my stomach. It's messing me up. So it's a way that is safer to go through it. But I've never gone through it in a safer way where it didn't feel is detrimental. Yeah. So my brain doesn't have that Sanskrit or neural pathway that says it could equal something else it's like no this is this is a gondola isn't that not not a gondola what's the thing that you go through where they beat you no where you go through gauntlet gauntlet that's the word yeah so anyways what about you what do you think um would you do it would i do it Mm -hmm. as a therapy session absolutely i would do it yeah but i don't know if i have this is silly, right? Oh, I think if I if I think I know what you're saying, yes. Well, no, I always am like talking about how we don't need to quantify our pain or our mm-hmm. trauma or our issues, right? But in my mind, I don't have severe enough PTSD mm-hmm. or severe enough trauma. Okay. Right? But the truth of the matter is I know that I would massively benefit from it. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, okay. What? Nothing. That's how you feel. It's just silly. Okay. Whether it's the fear that I have of doing it or, do you know what I mean? Right now, they're still in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. So it's still not 100% approved for regular Mm -hmm. everyday use. It's not even everyday use. So it's not like you can go sign up and say, this is where I'm at. Yeah, yeah. You have to go through all the whatever. Yeah, you have to go through the process. Um, But yeah, I think I would do it. I'm kind of like nervous about... I don't know what would come up. Yeah. It's fucking scary. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think back to like my trauma and I feel like I'm so well acquainted with it. Right? Yeah. What are you smiling at? I'm just listening pants? to you. I'm just listening to you. No judgment. 
a little bit of judgment. <laughs> well, let's hear your judgment. Out. No, keep talking. I, I, I don't know what would come up. Uh-huh. And not in the sense of like I'm nervous or scared, but it's also like, I don't know. I, I just don't know what trauma would surface that I would process and move through. Okay. And would have a lasting effect on me. And who knows, right? We obviously, neither one of us are therapists. Neither one of us have gone through this therapy. No, um, that's true. We're drinking beer, talking about it in our backyard right now. now. Because we're <laughs> handling this pandemic well. We are, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't at the beginning, but we got this fucker back on yeah, the road. That's right. We started drinking during the pandemic. No problem <laughs> like, with that. And now we're like, hey. Nothing wrong with drinking. No. Um, I don't know what would come up, babe. Yeah, I know. And it's like... Um, so much of my past have has been something that you know, let's chop down some trees, jackasses. Um, I was going to also ask you. I know you have been to therapy in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, what is your experience like when it comes to therapy? Because we talk about so many different things on this okay. podcast, but. Every now and then we'll reference therapy and people need to go to therapy and all that kind of stuff. But the truth of the matter is I personally don't have a lot of experience with it. I've been to a few therapists. I don't have great experiences. Yeah. I, I don't. I um. I know that there are great therapists out there and I know that talk therapy is... Um, I know, and it's not a, I read it in a textbook. I can feel it even with bad experiences. I can feel it in my being, how important it is to have that. Um, I was afraid because my first experience with a therapist was, well, this isn't going to be a light episode. Are we cool with that? Let's do it. All right. <clears throat> My first experience with the therapist was a family therapist when I was a child after my parents were getting back together after a split from uh, abusive situations. And I remember sitting in the middle of them, talking to the therapist together and being singled out and asking me how I thought and felt with my parents on either side. And I was like... Super safe and helpful, yeah. right? So I was like, I'm fine with everything. Everything's fine. I'm fine. Okay, good. Moving on. Yeah. So. Uh, Do you remember how old you were? Um, it's funny. I I was going to say like, like five or six, but this is an interesting part of the brain because I see myself as being very, very little. Yeah. But I know that they split up when I was 12. Mm. It was 12 or 13 that they got back. So I was at least... 12 but probably 13 and but my brain? memory i'm a little kid that's oh, wow. how small i felt and i didn't put that together till right now mm. um this is awesome we'll talk over the lumberjack <laughs> sorry folks um it's the my... price you pay for recording in your backyard do you want me to keep going yeah absolutely it's He'll... totally not going to sound like any kind of motivational go to a therapist speech it's why i'm so scared to go um my second one was when I was 16 and um, I was sexually assaulted by my best friend's stepdad and that fucked me up a little bit. There was already sexual abuse history and that was just my, my breaking point. Um, I kind of lost it. Yeah. Everything went to shit. <clears throat> and so my mom called a therapist who then had enough information from my mom without ever talking to me to know that I needed to go on antidepressants and called me in a prescription without ever talking to me or anything and started me on antidepressants and that didn't go well. Um, I didn't really have any way to regulate that because I was also self-medicating now at that point because everything was so, it was just a mess and she was It was weird. <laughs> I told her that, like, how I wanted to run away from home and do, you know, all these crazy the things. Therapist. The therapist. And how I felt like I needed to be on my own. And Did you finally go see her in person? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. I went to. This is the And everything, she was like, well, then that's what you should do. It was very encouraging as a 16-year-old trauma to, like, yeah, run away from home. 
and, and I was like, was like and I it. did. I dropped out of school and I freaking left. <laughs> and I'm like, that's probably not healthy. <laughs> um, so then I was nervous. And then there's been a couple of the other incidences since then to where the last one that I had, um, I don't even remember her name, but it shifted because I don't like talking about hard things that was hard for me. Yeah. So I'm also good at getting a therapist to talk about themselves. <laughs> yeah. So this last lady that I went to that may or may not be my um, place, I had like researched and researched and I had a crap ton of profiles pulled up on my phone and I was just looking Hold on and real looking. Quick. Didn't you go to um didn't you see somebody during like your twenties? Like, mm hmm Okay. So that one ended up I tried he was a nice man. I was scared to go to a man. I never really fully opened up, but I then was trying to help and got my ex into him. Okay. And then I stopped going so my ex could go because and then so I just kind of like gave up the therapist. <clears throat> yeah. And then and fast so, forward to most recently. Yeah. Which... So I had the one that talked about herself and the most recent only went to once. And I was really, really excited to go to her. And I'm still really excited to go to her. And I think another part of the reason of um, me being so hesitant is because she's not going to mess around or take my... Because she's the real she's deal. She's the real deal. And I'm like, mm. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm scared, yeah. but I also need it. Yeah. So I'm super hesitant, super, there's some really bad experiences. So I'm kind of a proponent of if this therapist is not working for you, find another one. Don't stick it out. If something doesn't feel right, if they want to prescribe you medicine that maybe you're feeling isn't the best idea, see somebody else. Go for it. Like, I don't know. I don't remember what your question was. Now I'm a little embarrassed. So where no, are we no. going now? My question was just what were your experience was with therapy. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, we covered it. I find one of therapist things. that I can't really, that I think is going to be a benefit and really help. And I'm like, shit. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay. Because it, I think it was a combination of uh, COVID hitting and everything like that as well. The timing of it Wasn't was. Wasn't it like the, the week after? I think it was like a week or two after. Yeah. It was very, it was very like, close. Because she, yeah, there was, she had, I guess I can't really say that because that's too much information. It was like two weeks. And I'm like, okay, therapy. Yeah. And I think I've had therapy great as a list on my podcast topics, but I finally took it off. I'm like, I, I never went. So there's nothing to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so I like totally wiped it off. Yeah. And, well, maybe you'll go back. I may. Maybe this is the catalyst. Fuck Maybe. Mars, and we can get this shit done during Mars retrograde. I feel like and... Mars retrograde, she's probably really busy, and I should wait. Maybe I'll go after November 13th. <laughs> Give her a chance to breathe. I don't remember... I don't remember ever seeing... It's, it I'm sounds sorry. like somebody's cutting down the tree in our backyard. It does. Maybe. Is yeah. it hanging over? God damn it. We're sorry, guys. Um, we could definitely end, but we're not going to. You just have to bear with us, and it's not the first time we've had annoying things in the background of this podcast. Uh, I don't think I saw a therapist when I was a kid. I don't have any memory of any time doing that um, at all. Uh, I, I have a vague, like super vague memory of seeing like a marriage counselor in my first marriage, but I think it was like maybe once or twice or something like that. So it's like a super vague recollection of it. Yeah. And then I saw a, he was a licensed clinical social worker. I remember that because I remember the title on his uh, business card. And um, that was probably like in my mid twenties, maybe 26, 27 year old, 27 year old or something like that. And um, I went to him for a while, whether it was, it wasn't like a year or something, but it was a good, good chunk of time when I went and saw him on a regular basis. And I really liked the guy. I really connected with the guy and really um, felt safe with him, felt comfortable in talking with him. And he, 
did a wonderful job of listening. He did a wonderful job of just kind of offering not even advice or he did a really good job of just kind of exploring my own mental health with me, if that makes sense, right? So I really, really liked the guy. And towards the end of, I remember now, as I'm thinking back to it, you know, it's the type of thing where insurance gives you X number of appointments and whatnot, right? Insurance. Yeah, you remember what insurance was, right? That's, a, that's fantasy land. <laughs> you remember in our previous life when yeah, we had insurance? That's right. Um, this is our insurance now, folks. It's just beer. And Built Bar. Go to <laughs> BuiltBar.com. Um, it's getting worse. It is getting worse. It's getting worse. That makes me think that they're going to be done soon. You hold? Yeah? Yeah. I'm trying to see where it's coming what? from. Should we start throwing things? B- empty beer bottles at them. <laughs> I don't even know what's going on. And I can't tell what direction it's coming from either. I can't. Over there. Good, yeah. Those neighbors. We like those neighbors. They're the ones that are always making noise. They How are. They do shit in their backyard. Noise, for hell's sake. Rude. You know we're in the backyard. It's our turn. Anyways. Um, this is going to suck if we get to the end of this and I go to edit it all and we're just going to have to scrap this entire fucking episode. Yeah. I'm going to be so pissed off. We have to come back out and record again tomorrow. It's pretty bad. It'll be okay. Okay. Um, so I was seeing this Sorry. therapist for a long time, and then it got towards the end of where the appointments ran out. And I remember he did a really good job of like working the system so I could get a couple more and a couple more and a couple more, right? Yeah. And then eventually it was like, "Sorry, this is it." And I couldn't afford to go see him without insurance. Mm-hmm. And one of the last things that we were getting around to was the idea that I wasn't bipolar. But I was cyclothymia, the terminology or the term for it is cyclothymia. So I was cyclothymic. So essentially the way that he explained it to me or the way that I understood it was, it was essentially just a lesser form of being bipolar. And so I had not necessarily that diagnosis because he wasn't a, um, whatever the classification is, he wasn't like a, psychologist or anything like that to where he could diagnose me with something but that was basically what his opinion was and I agreed with his opinion still no okay not anymore but at the time it made sense to me and it almost gave me a sense of peace Mm -hmm. and it gave me something to kind of research and look at and study and gave me some basis for understanding my patterns and my routines and things like that that were kind of easily um, easily kind of monitored and looked at from the outside and they made sense. <laughs> <laughs> Fuckers don't even have any trees over there. Right? Right? I don't know what's happening. It's definitely a chainsaw. Um, and then he also referred me out to go get... Uh, a prescription so he couldn't prescribe me medication okay so i went to somebody else to get a prescription mm-hmm. and i had one appointment with that old fart hated it and he gave me some sample packs of this so-and-so fucking whatever this medication was and i took it for like two days and i said fuck that so that was my only experience with any sort of like antidepressant medication or anything like that and after that i was just done i'm like i don't need to I definitely need therapy. I think I would be I would be incredibly I think I would benefit greatly from like a trained therapist. Um some of the things that I took away from like the whole cyclothymia thing was the natural patterns and rhythms that I fall into. Um especially with the seasons. Mm-hmm. I have a time period throughout the year where I would typically drop down into depression and it was very easy to look and see how that was a typical pattern it's usually in the winter months but it's usually from like november through february Mm -hmm. tends to be the time period where i get very depressed isn't that like it's called sad or something like yeah yeah, there's seasonal affective disorder yeah but this was a little bit different for me okay and um because there were some other time periods and things like that but It was kind of stuff like that of just really being able to look at my patterns and my routines in a different way and in a different light 
And now, I mean, now I feel like I'm so in tune with what my body does and what my mental health does and what my emotions do and all these kind of different things that it's, I don't think I need to be on any sort of medication, but I think I could definitely benefit from maybe a monthly therapy appointment. I don't know if I need it weekly just because I get so much, you know, even though men's group isn't therapy, Mm -hmm. sitting in that group week after week after week is massively beneficial. Yeah. So. Is it something you'd consider? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm hesitant, obviously. And it's, it's funny because it's the same bullshit things that it always is, right? Money, time. Money and time, and I don't really need it, and mm-hmm. what would I do, and why am I going to go talk we to need a other therapist? Things right now. It's not where money needs to go. Yeah, all those kind of different things, which yeah. are your arguments that mm-hmm. I immediately squash. Mm-hmm. You know, your same arguments. I'm like, uh, that's Can't dumb. afford it. You're sitting over there, can't afford it without insurance. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. Especially during a pandemic. But I don't know. Maybe I will look into it. It's so hard to find one, though. Yeah, Especially one that you like and one that you connect with and all that jazz. I know. It's such a pain in the butt. And it's not excited just to send you home with a pill and be like, here you go. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah, I have nothing against medication. And I think that it is beneficial for people, but I do think that it is overprescribed. I mm-hmm. think that it is not a fix-all, and I think that there are so many other avenues that should be uh, looked at and explored and taken prior to medication. I have a problem with medication. Do you? I have a problem with it. I know that there's benefits to it, but I think the way that it's handled is why it's problematic. I think that regular doctors that aren't psychiatrists or I don't even know. There's so many different ways to call them. This one does this. This one does that. I don't know. People that psychologists, will actually. Psychologists. Psychologists. Psychotherapists. Psych- psychiatrists. Licensed clinical social worker. LCSWs. Whatever. Right. Coach. Life coach. Neighbor. Right. Um, Doctors will just be like, you're depressed. Here's Prozac, Um, which can be a good thing if you don't have the resources too. But there's so little being done in that space. Just not even meeting somebody and prescribing them an antidepressant, I think is, I think is terrible. That was my experience. Another one I had is there was, um, it was, my goodness. was that span in my 20s I guess when we were talking from earlier and I was seeing the one who couldn't prescribe and referred me to another one that did prescribe and I had the session that you know it was this talk and trying to get through he's like you need medication which is I I did but I did not need it the way it came um there was so little interaction there's just basically like yeah 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 I have notes here take these and then this isn't working. This is doing this. This is causing me to fill this. And then it was like, well, up it by a half, up it by a hold, lower this one. Here, take another medication. And it was just, there was hardly any personal interaction. It was just like, okay, you're feeling weird. Add it up, add it up it to where my brain was so all over with medications. And I'm like, I can do this myself. Yeah. And so then I started trying to like just taper myself off of everything. And I almost killed myself because there's no structure. So if you're going to put somebody on mind altering medications, it can't be a passing thought. It can't be just something that you prescribe because everybody's depressed. Everybody's this, like you need to work with that person. You need to work with that person. There needs to be that conversation. You need to be able to, it's, you're messing with people's minds and then like throwing them out there to figure it out while they are literally having something that is messing with their mind. So that's, I have a problem with medication. Yeah. Done in that way. In a controlled setting where you have a team and people are caring about you and talking and there is that relationship, I think medication can be massively beneficial. But how often is that the case? Yeah, the whole situation is mishandled quite yeah. frequently. Um, I'm. <clears throat> opinion. It is your opinion, which That's is. just my opinion. It's your fucking podcast. It's you get to share your opinion. Of my opinion. Baby, I want to ask you if you're willing to talk about your abuse from uh, when you were a teenager more in the sense of giving some, it's not 
going back and replaying everything and telling the entire story of everything, but more from the standpoint of like some context over what happened in the loosest sense so that there's a little bit of framework, but what you have experienced and what you feel like that has, how that has impacted you and affected you your entire life. If you're, if you're, if you're okay doing so. And if you're not, well, we can totally I don't understand move on. what you mean, though. Like, are you talking about, like, there's a lot of abuse that happened when I was a teenager. Just like, what are you talking about? Are you, like, in regards to this? Or are you talking about what I experienced as a teenager? Like, the abuse. Like, what are you talking about? Specifically what you referenced earlier. The um, incident when you were 16 years old with your best friends. Just that? You can do as much or as little as you like. What's your goal? Help me understand. I'm going to try and talk because I think it's important, but I'm also like, it, uh, I'm a the, little scared, that, and I don't know what you're. I don't know what you're asking or what your point, like where you're leading to. So I don't want to. I don't want to throw things out there. That part right there, you just said. I'm going to talk because I think it's important. Okay. That's all. That's my goal. I didn't clear up anything. Okay. I don't have a direction, dear. Okay. I'm trying to be as delicate as possible because I know how difficult this is to discuss and how difficult this is to talk about. Okay. And you don't have to, and you can at any given point. We can just transition to something else. Okay. But I think it's massively beneficial both for you as well as other people that have similar experiences throughout their life. Okay. Um... Like you said, you had a lot of abuse um, throughout your life, even before mm -hmm. the incident when you were 16 years old. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of stuff that you had already experienced and a lot of trauma that you had already um, undergone, basically. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think were, just in general, <sighs> some of the side effects that you have dealt with because of all of that abuse and trauma? Um. Uh, patterns repeating, it's, um, I th it completely killed any self-esteem that I had, any worth, self-worth that I had. Um, it altered my conception, not conception, my perception of what love was and what love costs, um, changed the way like that I thought like what my body's purpose was um, can you speak to that a little bit more how did it alter what you viewed your body's purpose was um, Um, I guess the biggest was like, um, fuck, this isn't easy. This is pissing me off. Actually, I'm getting mad. <laughs> um, I'm getting scared. The biggest was like, my body isn't mine. And it is it is a disposable thing that is used just for I felt it was just used for others gratification and that I had choices of either conforming to that or I feel like either you, you provide or you die, <laughs> and which is funny because there's so much of it where you're like, I'll just die, but then you don't, you know, you don't, you don't want to, and then it becomes the outlet for anger for others, and then you just kind of disappear. 
you just kind of disappear. You don't think you're worth anything. You think you, you need, you like seek out aggressive men because, um, my experience was with men's abuse. So I'm not saying that women aren't abusive. I'm just, my experience was with men's abuse. So that's what I can speak to. You seek out aggressive men, um, not because you want to be attacked, but because that's what you see as power. So you know that even though this man is going to destroy you, <laughs> that nobody else is going to be. That was mine. There's also horrible stories where women and children have been passed around. That wasn't mine. Uh, mine was scary men keep the other scary men away. But you're not worth anything. It's only you. You have to keep them happy. You have to provide. You have to keep secrets. You have to... So that they... I don't know what to fucking say. So... I'm just kind of fucked up right now. Like, I don't know. Like, what am I supposed to say? You're fine, babe. The dynamic of seeking out uh, a guy that is going to be abusive and is going to be... It wasn't seeking out a guy that was going to be abusive. It was uh, seeking out somebody that was going to be a protector. And even though that meant that you had another price to pay. Another, yeah. But other people weren't going to be able. You had to worry about one person instead of multiple people. Almost. I was going to ask you, do you feel like that was a subconscious thing as well, obviously? I think that was absolutely a subconscious thing. Yeah. That is not something I had awareness of. Yeah. At the time, it was like, oh, this is different, and this is good, and this is a good person. I can just look back at it now and be like, oh, that's clearly what was happening. I had no concept of it at the time. And that's what was going on. Mm -hmm. I was just a mess. I had no idea. Yeah. How? What are some of the other like bigger ways that it impacted you throughout your life? Not even in the space of like relationships or mm -hmm. intimate partners or anything like that, but some of the other things like with anxiety and... <laughs> <laughs> anxiety is clearly not a problem for me um yeah very messed up with those kind of like suffer from depression anxiety ptsd there's too many things that happened that um i also don't know how to minimize things that aren't a big deal i know how to minimize things that are massive and make them not a big deal. Like, oh, this horrific thing happened, but I can't let it be horrific. So it's like, oh, well, if I wouldn't have done this, or this happened because of this, and wasn't this bad, and every, you know, these people have it worse, and this person, I heard the story of this person, I know this person who has it worse, so mine's not bad, mine's not bad, mine's over here. But then something little happens, and it's just this catastrophic thing. So, like, events are very... um flip-flopped you know how there was that comedian i think or maybe it was you that made a I joke you are pretty funny <laughs> but made a joke about teenagers how they're flipping out falling apart it's the end of the world and you're like what's happening and thinking it's this catastrophic thing and they can't find their phone charger yeah and it's like this little thing and so that's kind of like what the brain on that it's little things can feel like the end of the world because you you don't have any cushion because so many fucked up things have happened that it's not like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. It's like, it just pulls everything. It just takes you right back to the initial thing. Everything that triggers, it can be a word, it can be a said, it can be if somebody gets mad and just like goes, Arr! then you see that that was coming before. So then you think you have to go into damage control and protection and where are your kids and are your kids and you hear a siren and you're like where am I like all these things that just fuck with you where nothing is safe nothing is safe it's always something catastrophic somebody's always in danger you're just you're never safe you're never ever safe and your children are never safe because those are the ones that you're trying to protect the most so nothing is ever okay and then people get really annoyed around you because you're always scared and you're worried and you're overthinking things and you're overprotective and you're you're nothing's fucking safe so what do you do even though you're not in that environment anymore i don't live there anymore i haven't lived there for almost a decade but i'm still kind of fucked up yeah that so. was uh, one of the things that was challenging in the beginning of our relationship 
was when I would trigger you with yeah. just things. Like you said, it has nothing to do with it's just something, you know, I'm up frustrated and I slam the cupboard in the kitchen louder than I would normally Scaring me to death. do, right? Yeah, and at the time. it's just like ugh, pissed off and you slam the cupboard or something like that where it's not that big of a deal or – Maybe I walk in the back door and I don't even slam the door, but it seems like I did because the wind catches it and the door slams or something like that. If or... you're stomping, you walk fast. I could hear the stomp coming <laughs> yeah. to the direction of me or to the direction of the kids. Yeah. So many things. Yeah. There was a lot of things and I, I still struggle sometimes. I know uh, you are aware of this because it's you and me in this relationship, obviously, and you're aware of it, but um, I still struggle and not getting defensive and taking those things personal sometimes. But I think we've also gotten a lot Why? better. Why? It's almost been 10 years. <laughs> we've gotten a lot better in both uh, departments as far as like. You don't trigger me like you used to. I don't trigger Just by you. Be, it's, can I rephrase that, please? Mm -hmm. I don't get triggered as much as I used to. You never triggered me. It wasn't you. Yeah. It was just a trigger for me. You weren't being mean. You weren't. But I didn't know the difference. I had never experienced that life. Yeah. I'd never experienced where men don't hit, where men don't use violence to get what they want. I didn't know how to live like that. It's still hard at times. You know, I'm doing, I don't have patience for it now. I wouldn't stand for it. But that doesn't mean that I still don't get scared. Yeah. But I didn't, I didn't know how to live with somebody who wasn't violent. My brain couldn't. I didn't, I didn't know how to do there. it. Didn't know how to do it. Everything meant you were going to get violent even though you've never got violent you know you would you get angry of course but like i was never you're just not violent i don't know so i'm sorry i'm glad i don't i'm i'm rambling i interrupted you because i'm fucking terrified right Baby, now you're doing so good okay. you're totally okay it's not okay. a big deal um like i said i was just very surprised uh that you brought it up and that you shared it okay it is something that um Obviously, it's got a lot of stuff there. A little bit. There's a lot of stuff there. And not all of it is stuff that we're going to talk about on this fucking podcast, wow. obviously. But um, I really, really appreciate you talking about all the things that you talk about. And you have Thank been you. doing that consistently since we started doing this podcast every single week together. I don't need therapy. I got a podcast. <laughs> it's a t-shirt, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I think so. I don't need therapy. I listen to podcasts. Or you I feel me. like we should just trade more, like trade, like yeah. it's done. They heard it. Somebody's yeah. going to ding. I'm good. I don't need therapy. I got, I listen to podcasts. I listen to the energy is love podcast. Yes. You're very welcome listeners. Um, That's not a claim for therapy. It's not a substitute. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are not professionals. We are not licensed. For, what are all the things you're supposed to say now? <laughs> In case it wasn't obvious. Uh, don't <laughs> sue us because we don't know what the fuck There's we're talking no about. There's no professional claims. Yeah. <laughs> you should go to a therapist. <laughs> and tell them you heard about them on the Energy <laughs> Slip podcast. But, um, eat a built bar on your way. Eat built bar. <laughs> um, yeah, baby. I you have such an amazing story from one standpoint and what you have gone through and experienced over the course of your life. I mean, I feel like I probably know more than anybody else knows. You do. Um, but I also feel like the weight of what that has been like for you your entire life and some of the things that I don't know, right? I'm sure there's some things that you've forgotten or things that have disappeared in the in the midst of things right but what you have not just gone through and I don't want to make it seem like you have survived so much but the truth of the matter is you have I did. um but it's because you're so strong and I'm just very very grateful and I like when you share about your story on the podcast because I know without a doubt that it helps people. Yeah. I know without a doubt that people listen and are not just impacted by it, but it gives them the opportunity to feel like they're not alone and that they're not the only ones out there and that maybe it gives them the uh, safe space or the opportunity to even just take a breath and feel, sp feel safe in the moment. Yeah. And that's massively impactful. I hope that happens for them. I, I hope that does. I know it does. That would be amazing. I know it does. I promise it does. So, awesome. yeah. What else, babe? 
<laughs> I think it's shit. And I'm, I'm the, my brain's pudding. Your, your brain broke. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. I'm well, sorry. Don't be sorry. There's nothing wrong with a broken brain. Okay, good. We got a flat tire last week. That's we also on my did. list of uh, podcast topics because that's super entertaining. We don't get those. <laughs> we typically don't get flat tires. You're right. We don't. Yeah, we don't get flat that's tires. That's not like a thing of like, oh, here we go again. It's what? <laughs> um, We're not the people that get flat tires. Yeah, it was so fascinating to me how during that tiny little incident of getting a flat tire on our way to town excuse me it caused me so much stress and anxiety and it was kind of like this experiment for myself where I watched myself from outside of my body and I was able to see all the ways that I was handling that tiny little stressful thing nobody died we didn't have a blowout on the freeway we were totally able to like safely get off the road, get some air in the tire, get it repaired. It was the the most mundane flat tire experience that I've had in a really, really long time. But yet, I kind of lost my shit for a minute, and I got very stressed out. And I was watching myself go through it, and I was kind of getting frustrated with myself for a minute, and then I was also just kind of observing it and just letting it go. Because it was very fascinating to me that this tiny little thing would cause this big reaction. So then I looked after the fact. I this is actually something that I have been processing for quite some time. Okay. Not to the extent. Not anymore. I'm excited. It's been a while, but you love. Um, what? It was. <laughs> no, no. It was like the. <sighs> the level of emotional stress that I was under in the time was the reason why something like that was such a big deal, right? I wasn't in the space of like, everything's okay and everything's going well. And I was very, very, very emotionally taxed and stressed out in the moment. So we didn't have physical things. We didn't have like errands that we had to run and a tight schedule to get to this. You know, we didn't have some of those other like, outwardly things everything was internal I was in so much internal strife and stress and I don't it wasn't chaos it definitely wasn't chaos but it was it was some some deep emotional work that we were in and had been for several days and so it was kind of fascinating to me to see how even that (laughs) can fuck shit up obviously but even that is enough to cause that type of stress and anxiety to take place over the simplest things like a flat tire. You know, there's times where stuff like that happens. You've seen it before. Not just with a flat tire, but there's some there's times where stuff like that happens and I handle it like I mean it just rolls off my back. Like it's a fucking it's not a big deal. Like whatever. No big deal, right? And we just clean up and we move on and everything's okay and there's nothing wrong. Mhm. And I got to that point that day. I was able to get to that point that day. But it took me quite a while to get there. Mm -hmm. And it took me quite a while to come down from the anxiety and the stress that I was feeling. And then I kind of laughed at myself and it was comical. And then the next few days and so on and so forth, I really went back and looked at it. And I'm just like, holy shit. The emotional toll that I was under was such a big... um, uh, such a big benefactor to that experience. And that was kind of fascinating to me. I wish I could have, like, you know, not done it. <laughs> I wish I could have kind of maintained a little bit more of my... I, I didn't... It's not like I lost my shit or I didn't get mad or anybody, but hmm. I just instantly take the environment that I'm in and intensify it. I just instantly make things way more tense for everybody around me as well as for myself. Everything becomes much more stressful and much more tense. And I hate that. I hate being in it. Even when I'm in it, I know I'm in it. And I'm like, God damn it, fucking relax. I fucking hate it when shit feels like that. And sometimes it's so hard to make it, to change it, to make it not feel like that. So, I don't know. It was kind of interesting. Do you have any thoughts on it? I think just the awareness of it is 
Like that's one of those things that you can go back at. I think I don't have any thoughts on it. I think it's cool that you had the awareness and that you were watching yourself and you were able to think about it and just kind of watch how that took place and just let it be a, just let it be that without anything that you did wrong or any of that. You're just like, well, okay, that's kind of, that's kind of fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing good. You and I evolving. Look at us evolving. This is what evolution looks like, folks. Can I touch cards? Yes. Well, I forgot. You, <laughs> <laughs> you can touch one card. I want. Pick a card, any card. All oh, the cards. that's your card. I you want, can touch it. I want to touch all the cards. No, you can't touch all the cards. <laughs> um, hopefully, we'll find out when I go back and edit this, and hopefully the jack, not jackhammering, the chainsaw asshole lawnmower guy in the backyard didn't ruin this episode because it's a pretty fucking powerful episode. Welcome back to the podcast after a week off. Um, I was saving it. Saving it up. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen next week? You got so much to share. <laughs> You're so fucked up, baby. You can keep this podcast going It has going nothing to do with time. fucked up stuff. It has to do with everything oh. that you have inside of you that you need to share with everybody out there. Mm, okay. Earlier today, you told me something very sweet about how impactful I was in my words and how... I have all of this, like, I impact people with, yes. you know, I, I have an effect on people. Yes. So do you. Nobody has told me if I ever go anywhere on a boat, they want to come to. So do you. How many people hey. in this podcast space have heard that before? Helen Keller, I'm talking to you. <laughs> the answer so is you. Do Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening, folks, and tuning in to another wonderful episode. I think this is episode 210, if I remember correctly. That's awesome. Uh, go to our website, energyislovepodcast.com, and there's a tab up top now for sponsors. You can see all the information for Built Bar. Delicious. Amazing protein bars that we're super infatuated slash in love with. and We have a freezer mm -hmm. full of right now. Because they are really good cold, too. <laughs> it is a snack. It Built, is a snack. <laughs> BuiltBar.com. Enter in Energy is Love at checkout and save 10%. Plus, they always have free shipping, which is pretty sweet. So go do that. Support the podcast and get some amazing freaking delicious protein bars today. I love you. I love you. You're an amazing woman, Steph. Amazing work, Craig. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>